In view of all of this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence, and moral excellence with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with patient endurance, and patient endurance with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love for everyone. The more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I remember as a kid going to Woolworths with mum and dad and taking home uh, thick brown paper bags full of groceries. Does anyone remember those days? Yeah? Um, Emily, you're too young to remember that. <laughs> Uh, they weren't like the 25 cent ones we have to get today, you know, with the little paper handles and people complain because they break if they load them up too much. You had to pick them up from underneath because there was no handles. You still remember them? No. <laughs> um, <clears throat> they were, I think, bigger than the paper bags we have now. Or maybe I was just smaller, I'm not sure. Uh, somehow... I don't remember when the transition happened to plastic. But today we see the reversal of all that, don't we? Uh, in the last few years, we've been hearing a lot about plastics. The disposal of plastics, the reuse of plastics, the overuse of plastics, and uh, not using the plastic shopping bags, etc. The biodegradability or non-biodegradability of plastics, etc. And uh, more recently, we've been hearing more about microplastics, right? And how we all have microplastics in our bodies. I always thought that perhaps it was something to do with the food packaging, that we must be ingesting all these plastics or something. And so, you know, every time I use my knife now or something to cut something and there's some plastic or something, I always wash the knife so I'm not you know, accidentally getting a little bit of plastic in me. Uh, but, you know, last week, as I was listening to the radio, there was a professor on the radio, and he was talking about how 70% of the microplastics we find in us, we actually don't eat. We breathe them in. Did you know that? I didn't know that. We breathe them in, and you go like, what, how? Well, so much of our clothing today is made from synthetic fibres, isn't it? Whether it's polyester or nylon or acrylic or spandex or, you know, vegan leather uh, made out of PVC or polyurethane. Uh, just think, you know, for those of you who use a washer and dryer at home, if you use your dryer, you pull out that lint thing just from one load and there's so much lint that comes out. Isn't that true? How much must your synthetic clothing be shedding? We each ingest, they say, approximately one ping pong size ball of microplastics every year. And, you know, so they were talking on the radio, so like, you know, what's the solution? What's the solution? You know, if we do everything cotton, well, you know, that's bad for the environment because it uses so much water or pesticides or whatever. You know, what is the solution? And the solution that the guy was saying, well, basically, we need to buy less clothes. That's the solution. We need to make and buy less clothes. Use it until it's used, not just throw it away once I've worn it a few times or one season or whatever. So <clears throat> the situation we're in, you know, it hasn't happened overnight. The use of plastics has grown steadily for decades and scientists are still trying to work out what the effect is on human health and the possible correlation of various illnesses, you know, I don't know about you, but in our family, we were just talking the other week about how so many people, it seems, are getting some sort of cancer. Is that true? Microplastics. They soak up heavy metals 
And we know heavy metals can uh, be harmful to us and negatively impact different things, including our uh, fertility, apparently. And, uh, and who knows? Who knows what other aspect of our health these microplastics might be having? It's like the world has been on cruise control for far too long in this space. And sadly, too many things in life we tend to conveniently kind of just switch to cruise control. But the Bible tells us that we need to practice self-control, right? Not cruise control, self-control. Another word for that that we use is temperance. Temper what, you say? Never heard that word. Or maybe the last time I heard that word was when Grandpa was teaching me to ride a bicycle. Or when Woolworths had those old shopping bags. Um, why would it be important for us to learn about temperance or self-control? What does it include? Since when is it important even for a Christian? You know, don't I, can't I just accept Jesus and then continue on doing whatever I want to do? We all have issues. Isn't that true? We all have issues with some aspect of temperance. So how can it be put into practice? I found this article here in the, in the paper about, in my online paper, <laughs> about how birds even practice temperance. When given two favorite foods, they know that if they, they wait and don't eat their second favorite food, that then the, the favorite one they can have it later on. Some birds can hold out for, as, as, for 20 seconds, but some birds can go five and a half minutes waiting to get what they really want. Describing temperance, one person put it this way. Temperance is the capacity to manage habits and protect against excess. It is composed of forgiveness, humility and patience. Another puts it this way. The virtue of temperance encourages the use of moderation, self-discipline and self-control in all areas of life. And yet another put it this way, temperance means restraint and moderation. But if you're talking about alcohol, temperance does not mean drinking in moderation. It means abstinence or not having any at all. As far as I recall, temperance was always, you know, if something is good for you, you can do it in moderation. If it's, it's bad for you, you just don't do it at all, right? In the United States... Um, they had the earliest kind of temperance societies and generally they believe that they kind of began with the Methodists in the 1820s, the Methodist church. And so, you know, Adventism was in its very much infancy around that time and so it must have impacted the Advent movement as well and ultimately Seventh-day Adventists as well. So by the time the Seventh-day Adventist church kind of got organised and and uh, you know, Ellen White had health visions, etc. In the um, in the early 1860s, the temperance movement was already kind of in full swing in America, and mainly it was a movement that advocated against alcohol. And interestingly, it was mostly run by women. The temperance societies were run generally by women who were sick and tired of abusive men and drunkenness in the community, etc. the impact that alcohol was having on the community. I imagine that a similar movement today would probably make a significant dent in the plague of domestic violence that we see in Australia. But I don't think anyone has the will to tackle the big alcohol companies today or even the government for that matter, because the government made somewhere between 15 and 20 billion dollars, that's billion with a B, out of tax from the alcohol companies every year. Amazing. So much money. In the 1870s, Ellen White advocated that Adventist, Seventh-day Adventist church members should even go out and vote on Sabbath. Can you imagine? <laughs> Vote, go out there and vote on Sabbath in order to help elect a government official who's going to support the fight against alcohol. Well, today we really don't need the government to tell us 
as they have been for the last few decades, you know, that women should have one standard drink and men can have two. You remember those ads? I haven't seen that. I don't know, maybe I don't watch television, so I don't know, but do they still have those ads? I haven't seen them for a long time. Uh, today, secular scientists confirm that every single drink is doing us harm. Secular scientists. The Apostle Paul, when writing to the Corinthians, and you know, the Corinthians were surrounded. They were in a pagan culture. It was a port city. And there would have been many cursing, swearing, drinking sailors there. He writes in 1 Corinthians 6, here verses 19 to 20. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and you are not your own, for you were bought at a price? Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. With current scientific evidence, we need temperance when it comes to our body. There's plenty of good reasons that the Seventh-day Adventist Church took a stand for abstinence all those years ago when it comes to alcohol, but I believe that science is catching up today. Science is catching up to what I believe is a biblical position, not just an Adventist position, a biblical position on the poison of alcohol. Now, temperance, of course, is much more than just food and drink, isn't it? History shows us that um, it's easy for us humans to kind of get ourselves into certain situations that require some temperance or some self-control, but because we fail to do so, it ends up causing harm to us and harm to others. Isn't that true? The wise man Solomon put it this way in Proverbs 25, verse 28. Those who do not control themselves are like a city whose walls are broken down. And the Bible gives us plenty of examples of both poor and good self-control. I want to put up a little table here. Well, it's kind of a big table, actually. <laughs> of both good and poor self-control. So if we look at the uh, poor self-control side, we see there Adam and Eve. Uh, they coveted what? power, knowledge from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And what, what was the effect? Clearly opened the floodgates for sin into the whole world, right? Later on, we had Esau. He had an issue with impatience, his appetite. And what did it bring? It brought hatred. It brought family dysfunction, family breakdown as a result. Achan, who was greedy and disobedient to, to the instructions from God, and he, he, he took, you know, the spoils. Uh, what happened to him and his whole family? They perished, didn't they? David, of course, we have, we have, we have David on both sides, actually, which is an interesting one. David's always an interesting character. But David, you know, he had his affair with Bathsheba, and then organized for her husband to be murdered. What happened? He lost respect across all of Israel and, of course, brought discord to his own family. His own sons ended up dying as a result of his sin. Uh, Samson, who didn't control himself in the area of lust, etc., he broke promises that were made, failed in his mission that God had given him and unfortunately died an early death. King Saul was impatient, he was rebellious, and what happened? He lost his position as king and ultimately his salvation. Uh, and Peter, Simon Peter, who thankfully changed, he repented, right? But because of his fear, his underlying faith issue actually caused him, his anger to come out and uh, caused him to deny his Lord, right? If we look at the good self-control side, we see Joseph there who refused uh, to jump into bed with Potiphar's wife. And what happened? He was elevated to, uh, you know, the position of prime minister, second in charge to the Pharaoh. Moses, who could have many times lashed out in anger at what the people were up to, but he was silent, wasn't he? Silent, And even to this day, Moses is like, you know, the most respected leader uh, among the Jewish people right down to this day. Isn't that true, uh, Mary? So, you know, he was one like Christ. And uh, he was, you know, one of, uh, one of uh, um, few 
that was, that's already been resurrected, according to the scriptures. David, who we see, as I mentioned, on both sides, he chooses to spare Saul's life when he could have cut him down there in that cave. So he honors God. He shows leadership and uh, gains respect of those who are following him. Solomon, uh, who requests wisdom over wealth and then ends up what? being doubly blessed by God as a result. On the good side of self-control, we also see Nehemiah, who doesn't fight back to those who are kind of trying to stop him and antagonizing him, but he remains focused and completes the mission of rebuilding Jerusalem. Of course, we have Jesus on this side, who is heckled by different people at different times. He's, uh, he's tempted sorely by Satan. But he's always victorious with his responses. The way that he comes back, responds with the word uh, and uh, and doesn't fall into the trap. And we see Stephen composed there in adversity and he's faithful to the end. So we have both sides, if you like. Clearly the scriptures give us like a broad spectrum, a real life spectrum to learn from at both ends of this good and poor self-control spectrum across different facets, different areas of life, if you like. Um, In the book of Romans, chapter 12, verse 2, Paul says, Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the what? By the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Most Adventists, when they hear the word temperance, most likely think of health. Isn't that true? They think of health. Uh, And um, quite often, their eyes will roll. (laughs) For the Adventists, anyway. The non-Adventists are interested, but the old-time Adventists, you know, they roll their eyes. Oh, temperance. Oh, health again. Yeah, I know all about that. Next. True? Am I telling the truth? Well, with temperance, it's, it's not just what you do with your food or with your drink. It's all-encompassing, isn't it? Although, as we see today, with the limits on resources and the planet and planetary groanings, if you like, what we eat and drink actually does have an impact on our physical environment, as well as our human, our social well-being, our emotional well-being. So, pausing just a little bit longer on health, I want to share an interesting analogy that was presented at a conference I went to earlier this year by uh, Dr. Darren Morton, who's, who's the Director of Lifestyle Medicine at Avondale University. He presented on the health of people and the planet. And I found it really, really interesting. And I asked him for the PowerPoint to see if I could adapt it and use it in one of my sermons. And, uh, you know, it goes like this. Uh, There's a disease, you know, biological pathology, if you like. Somebody has a chronic disease. It might be, you know, type 2 diabetes or something like that, a lifestyle kind of disease. And uh, this is adapted, by the way, from a paper on uh, obesity, chronic disease and economic growth. Um, by, by Egger, and I guess he may have been the presenter that Darren was at listening to this uh, presentation. And, uh, and so because of the, you know, somebody's got this disease, well, we ask the question, well, what's the cause of that? Uh, and so, you know, there's uh, meta-inflammation, you know, the person might have insulin resistance, or they might be obese, etc. Uh, And so the presenter kept asking, well, we need to go further than that. In lifestyle medicine, it's not just about, okay, ching, ching, here's the drugs, this will help you. It's like, what's the cause of that? True? That's what lifestyle medicine is all about. And so, so he was saying, I was at this conference, and the presenter got everybody to say, well, what's the cause of that? Okay? So I'll do the same thing here with you, get you guys involved, all right? Okay? So this person has insulin resistance or obesity, so what's the cause of that, right? Well, the proximal causes, as in, you know, those that are immediately obvious, 
uh, is probably overnutrition, inactivity, etc. And you say, what's the cause of that? Well, the medial causes, maybe a little bit further away, is energy use or, you know, overconsumption. Our modern lifestyle causes these diseases, true? What's the cause of that? Okay, so the distal causes, those that are, you know, even further away, is economic growth. Hello. We have our economist over here uh, seeing this model and how economy impacts our health. But then you look over on this side, the ecological pathology side. How's it all affecting the planet? Okay, and today we hear all about climate change, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and uh, the risk factors, the markers, if you like. You know, you've got eco formation, carbon resistance, if you like, or global warming, etc. What's the cause of that? Waste production or pollution. You know, well, what's the what's the cause of that? Energy use, overproduction, our modern lifestyle, and what's the cause of that? economic growth. Now Darren says he was sitting next to somebody at this conference because the speaker basically finished here and you know wound it up and the guy sitting next to him says oh, well what's the cause of that? <laughs> and Darren being a Seventh-day Adventist and the guy sitting next to him as well what's the cause of that? And this is the six million dollar question isn't it? Because what's the cause of that? It's the human condition, isn't it? The human condition and the, the problem of our human condition is sin, isn't it? Sin. We live in a world that is affected by sin. And of course, this leads in our world today to the problem of affluenza. How many of you have affluenza? Affluenza is the painful, contagious, socially transmitted condition of overload, debt, anxiety and waste resulting from the dogged pursuit of more. Relentless pursuit of economic growth, advocating consumerism, has an adverse effect on our health, on our planet, and the problem is, the underlying problem is human sin. The sin condition. God said in Genesis 2, if you go this way, you shall die. Some people translate this as dying, you shall die. It's a process that began, right? Uh, Adam and Eve didn't die straight away, but the process began within the human and on the planet. Our self-control or lack of it has ultimately led to death and destruction. And so Paul wrote in Romans 8, 22, for we know that the whole creation groans and labors. Everyone, the animals, the people, the planet itself. What's the solution? What's the cause of that? <laughs> no, but what's the solution? For us as believers, Jesus is always the solution, isn't it? Jesus, we need Jesus to come back, right? We need Jesus to step back in and, uh, and to make things right. Jesus came into this world to give us hope. Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. There is power in the name of Jesus. In Philippians 4.13, we read what? That I can do all things through Christ who provides strength. True? So, so what should accepting and following Jesus teach each one of us? To remain the same? No. It ought to cause us to lean more and rely more on Jesus. The Lord told the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, he says, My grace is sufficient for you. 
My strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities, Paul wrote, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, just like Paul, we too need to rely on the power of Jesus, right? His grace is what can change each one of us. It can change us. It can change me. I need that. I need that. You need that. We all need it. We all need to rely on Jesus and his grace. Paul writes in uh, Titus chapter 2 here, uh, verses 11 to 14, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. To how many? To all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled or temperate lives, uprightly and godly lives in this present age, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour Jesus Christ. While we wait for the second coming, we are instructed here that there are certain things that we need to say what? No to. Say no who gave himself, Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. We need to look to Jesus. Look. Look to Jesus for help. The truth is, friends, we all struggle in different areas of temperance. Isn't that true? We all struggle in different areas of temperance. What do you struggle with? If you recognize the struggle, then clearly the Holy Spirit is alive and active in your life, trying to refine some aspect of your life. Perhaps the area of self-control that you're challenged with might be in your time management. Perhaps it's excess of food or drink or consumption or use of harmful foods or drinks or other things? Could it be overwork that is your thing that you're challenged with? The relentless pursuit of money? Could it be consumerism and spending? Could it be greed or gambling that is your thing? Could it be your language? Bad language, gossip. Could it be your pride or ambition? Could it be lust or sexuality? Could it be anger issues? What is it for you? Different things for different people, isn't that true? We need the Holy Spirit to teach us, to guide us, and therefore it's so important to look to Jesus, to be close to Jesus. We're promised that Jesus, our high priest, right, is able to understand our weaknesses. True? He's able to understand. He was tempted in every way, but he didn't sin. And so that's why we can feel uh, emboldened, very sure, if you like, to come boldly to the throne of grace because there we can find grace and mercy when we need it. In the modern world that we live in, it was meant to be simpler. (laughs) I remember reading that probably before you were born, Emily, before those brown bags at Woolies. Um, I remember reading that technology was meant to make life simpler. There would come a time where people would just be relaxing most of the time and just working 10 or 20 hours a week. Anyone remember that? <laughs> the oldies, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm in that camp. Uh, somehow over time, it's been the very opposite, isn't it? Most working people today are in a rush 100% of the time, just stressed. Too busy for God too busy to even think about dealing with issues relating to their self-control. True? 
I even hear sometimes retired people saying, I don't know how the day goes so fast. <laughs> Retirees. My parents say that. You know, where's the day gone? In the book Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, the author writes, Hurry is a form of violence on the soul. Another quote from that book is, in the end, your life is no more than the sum of what you gave your attention to. I remember back in the day when I was working for a consulting firm and every 15 minutes you had to check, you know, which client you were going to bill for every 15 minutes. I think lawyers do every six minutes, right? Uh, but, um, yeah, yeah, there was this American guy there that I was working for. He was a snowboarder and he would, you know, he'd prefer to be out snowboarding than, as he would say, than working for the man. He said, we're working for the man here, Daniel, he would say. Working for the man. Working for the shareholder, basically. Um, clearly, hurry has an effect on our relationships, on our families, on our friendships, on our church, on salvation. Is your life on cruise control with the hurry button firmly depressed? Then let Jesus take the controls. Jesus offers to take the controls. Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are tired and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Accept my teachings and learn from me because I am gentle and humble in spirit and you will find rest for your lives. We all need that, don't we? Thank God for the Sabbath. Isn't that true? But, friends, we can have even more. Jesus offers us more. The Sabbath is like, you know, at the apex. But we can have more. One of the reasons Jesus established the church is that so we could encourage one another, to help one another. In the book of Acts, we see, we read there that the church met how often? They met daily, all right? They met daily. Now, I'm not saying you have to come here every day. <clears throat> but some time ago, I asked for volunteers for a program that are called Homes of Hope. You remember that? It was meant to be advertised today, but I didn't see it up there. So I'm going to advertise it now. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and I want to thank those 12 or more people that offered up their homes to open up to groups. Um, and if you haven't done that yet and you would like to do that at some stage, let me know as well. But the idea is that just once a month, you know, so not cutting in too much into your lives, once a month, you can come together at someone's house in the church, meet up with friends for a time of fellowship, time of food, and building up faith. Does that sound good? Every month, towards the end of the month, three homes will be open at different times so that you can choose one that might work for you. And so for the month of August here, we have right here in Wallara, we have Emily. Uh, and that'll be on a Saturday night, uh, possibly at 6.30, but depending on who wants to go to that group, I'm sure Emily can kind of be a flip bit flexible with that time. And uh, if you want to go to that, just let Joyce know. She'll be writing down some names. There's, there's limits, you know. Some of our members at church here just live in a little studio. So they can't, can't have more than like five people come to their place or four people even. Other people could probably fit all of us into their home, right? But um, the other one there is Glebe, and that's on a Sunday morning, and that's at Dalila's place. Pastor Stephen at Bondi Beach with a great view over the beach. Uh, so if you want to go to any of those, that'll be on a Wednesday, Wednesday morning, okay? So for those of you who, who are retired or, um, you know, living off your share portfolio or something like that, uh, you can be there on a Wednesday at 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, and um, so every month we'll have three homes like this towards the end of the month, in the second half of the month or right in the last week or something like that. In September, we will have Mary at Randwick. Uh, she's opening up her home for Rosh Hashanah. And uh, then Christelle at Crow's Nest on a Saturday night. Uh, Adriana's at Maroubra on a Wednesday 
afternoon. And, uh, and then in October, we have John and Ruby's at Chatswood on a Sunday morning, Marita on a Wednesday afternoon at Aloha, and uh, Andrew and Yana at Waverley on a Friday night. So all sorts of options, okay? Just choose one, one a month, okay? Don't go to all three, don't crash every party. Um, but look, you know, the idea is that, um, that we come together, that we can encourage each other. I think it's important to be refreshed as a church family outside of the Sabbath time to build togetherness, don't you think? Uh, we need each other to grow. Uh, and, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit works through each one of us. And as believers, we can encourage each, each other. Uh, it'll be good for those who attend, but it'll also be good for the host. Be good for the host. Trust me. Solomon writes this in, um, uh, I thought I had it up there, but I don't have this one. But look, Solomon writes in Proverbs 11.25. He says, a generous person or a hospitable person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Do you like that? Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. You know, there's always happiness, refreshment in blessing others. It gives space for the Holy Spirit to act in each of our lives. It provides an environment where believers can come and refresh each other. And, uh, and for the fruit of the Holy Spirit, which is up there, right? The love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and that word, temperance. Self-control, right? Self-control. All of those things can, can become part of our life, take hold of each one of us in the community. You know, knowledge is a good thing, but we need to put it into practice, right? We need to put our knowledge into practice. And that's why in the um, scripture reading that we had earlier, we read that Peter said, add to your knowledge, what? Temperance. Add to your knowledge temperance. Let me put it up again for those of you who might have missed it the first time. He says here in 2 Peter 1 verses 5 to 8, But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control or temperance, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord wants to take us on a journey, the best possible journey. And the recipe, if you like, is right here for an abundant journey of a disciple. I can't imagine that it happens too often, but I suppose there have been times when a person has gone skydiving and jumped out of the aeroplane without a parachute. Many times it's happened that their parachute doesn't open, right? And I guess, you know, when these things happen, miracles can happen, of course, but generally speaking, a person is not going to defy the law of gravity, true? True? None of us here, I hope, would be inclined to jump without a parachute. <laughs> However, having said that, a subtle deception that we can all fall into is when we break spiritual laws, we think that nothing will happen. But things do happen. They just don't happen as immediately as jumping out of an aeroplane. They happen slowly over the course of one's life. And the effects of breaking spiritual laws may not be immediately, but they still do occur. Friends, God wants to bless us. God wants to bless us with an abundant life. He wants to keep us from harm and to give us the things that bless. Does that make sense? Sometimes people look at the things in the Bible and they say, oh, you know, it's all about rules. 
God puts all of these things into place to stop us from having fun. No. God wants to bless you with an abundant life. He doesn't want you to go on the slow path to destruction. So the question for us today is what is your spiritual journey like today? Would you like for it to be better? How many would you like for their spiritual journey to be better? Amen? Yeah, I think, I think all of us are in that camp. So today, ask Jesus. Ask Jesus to pour out his grace, his power on your life, to help you deal with the things that you need to change, to help you to, to let go of certain things, to help you to, 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 to take off the burdens that weigh you down. Help the Lord to help you in the areas of self-control, the temperance issues that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, that you may live an abundant, fruitful life. God bless. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, as we live our lives every day, may every day be a day of worship. May you bring things to our attention that we may need to address in our lives and give us the will to have the will to follow your will. We pray for your power, for your grace in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.